Welcome, everybody, back to another episode of Roots. Thank you for, uh, for everyone tuning in and listening. Um, we've designed this as a series of conversations um, between my mom, between myself and our family um, to understand our history, to understand our present, and to connect it to with the intent to, um, you know, form a stronger um, and more wholesome relationship than before. Yeah, so the conversation is not just the bridging, but because I came from a background that Alexander has no idea what it was like. And that's why this conversation, so he can learn more about his grandparents, his parents, and uh, the way I grew up in my family. So in the last couple of episodes, my mom and I had spoken about how she grew up, um, what her family was like. And in this episode, um, we wanted to start to break down kind of some of the factors that went into her life as she was growing up, specifically Vietnam, after the war, after things were changing. Um, she was in a period of, 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 of a lot of dynamic stuff that was happening all at the same time. And so mom, today I wanted to talk to you about what you witnessed, you know, really see it through your eyes and try and understand and empathize about what you were witnessing, what you were having to do um, and how that felt. Yeah, I, I, I think that's kind of the premise that I want to set. Um, do you have anything else to add there? So what's your first question? I wanted to talk with you um, and hear about your experience after the war was over, after the North started to come down in mass. Um, you had spoken briefly and, and written briefly about what it was like, how it felt. I want to, I, I want to hear about it and just take me through kind of like a couple of key days for you where it was like, wow, things are really changing. Things are really different. And because, because I think the most unique thing is right. Like I've never experienced this as a kid in America, you know, there's yeah. never been, there's never been a, um, a point or, or, or a massive change in government policy. Let me walk back to 45 years ago holy it's just like yesterday huh i know mm -hmm. um so i was about 12 um and that was in mm, april 30th of 1975 so there's a lot of chaotic things and um you see all the scene that the helicopter scene and on top the rooftop of the embassy i don't know if you <laughs> You watch that. That's like historical uh, clip from from people uh, trying to run away, trying to get out of the country. Your dad was trying to jump into the large merchant boat with his siblings, and there's hundreds of thousand people that rush to the embassy and trying to get through whatever gate that they can get to get out. Now, for us common people. Um, we didn't know much. And my dad actually was offered by the colonel uh, that he worked under to get the private jet. And he said that if you want to go with us, I can take your family with us. And my dad was like, oh, no way. I'm not going to go to another strange country, not knowing where to start all over again. You know, I came to this country when I was three and uh it took me a long time to build up where I am. So he refused. Yeah. So our luck would be very, very different uh, um, if we had hop on that helicopter with his boss and um, get out of Saigon, but mm -hmm. we didn't. So it, instead, my dad with, you know, hundreds of thousand people got, go out, went out to the street and cheered the, the Northern Army because it was kind of like a takeover, ra relatively peaceful. Mm -hmm. So for the whole first year, actually, they didn't really do things um, drastically. So the first couple months, everything was still normal. We're still using the old currency. And, um, and they were still settling. You know, the, the people, yeah. from the army from the north coming in, they still settling. And they is going through the house cleaning type of thing. They start uh -huh. taking people from the older military, from the former military and, um, and start gather those people together and send them to re-education camp. And the point is say that, oh, you're going to go for um, a week or two. And a lot of people turn out to be months or even years. 
So take me through a couple of these events. Were, were you there during like the parade day? Did you line up on the street with your oh, dad? Oh, no, no way. For a 12 years old kid? No, my, I, my dad is so strict. I can't even go out, you know, I, if I'm playing out in the street is when my dad is not at home. And I don't uh-huh. go wandering around the street at that age. Uh, I, I didn't want to be crushed, you know? <laughs> yeah. It's, it's still pretty chaotic, but um it's just the commotion of the adults and the, the kids know about it. 12 years old is pretty much understand quite a bit, but mm-hmm. I did not remember anything that I did that is memorable. You know right. what I mean? It's just like right. you hear okay. things on the street, you watch the news on TV and, you know, everybody was cheering. You see things and then you see that um, um, servicemen that um, trying to, dump their old uniform on the street oh, nobody yeah. want to associate with the old regime and they mm-hmm. all went through their pictures books anything that going against communism or against the north they burned those books any yeah. you know, cd song uh, not cd at that time they didn't have cd um but cassette tape or anything that is related so all the evidence most of people are cleaning house when the transition of power happened it, you know you, so you're, are you saying that like for pretty much like a, a whole year, not a lot changed, right? It was business Dra- as usual. Very, very slow changing. It's mm-hmm. not drastic. It's not overnight. But uh, I after a year later, then things are start to feel like you got ears and eyes everywhere. Okay. It's almost like 1984 from. Yeah, uh, like Big Brother always George, watching. Oh, yes. You know, if you if you slip, you say something and if your neighbors or somebody reported to the higher official, you have no idea. Yeah. So really, really you start scary. seeing you start seeing people slowly disappear. It's like a really, really scary version of the PTA. It is super scary. Uh, uh-huh. But for us, kid, I didn't know much, but things are start to tighten up. Uh, yeah. You can't, you know, goods on the on the market slowly being um, controlled by the government. So, so, so like for the first year, like, was there any reason for you to care as much when, when things started to change? I mean, like, it sounds like it was business as usual. You know, you were still like school wasn't different at that. At that at oh, that yeah. School is different, yet. too. School is different. You start studying different history because now the tides turn. So, uh, you know, whatever we study in, in Chinese about uh, Taiwan and the history of Vietnam, everything mm-hmm. has changed because the history is in a different, is the different side now. You, you're not saying the same thing. I mean, you, yeah. you hate capitalism, you hate uh, Americans, you hate, you know, all those brainwash stuff start yeah. to sing in we we become um the the red scarf um uh, youth that everybody oh my god today i'm wearing a red <laughs> scarf. so you know kids are wearing red scarf and then you go into school and you sing a lot you sing about um back hall and meaning uncle ho you sing mm-hmm. to praise uncle ho all the time um, and a lot of revolutionary uh, war songs. It just bombarded with the brains, you know, with the purpose of brainwashing. I can't, rem- I can't like even imagine what that's like because I think the closest thing we ever get to that in like the American like education system is a pledge of allegiance to the flag. That's it, you know. Oh there's, yeah. There's, there's not a lot of you know. There's there's not a lot of saying like. I mean, we 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 obviously think about history as, as how it's very American centric, but it's not like America is necessarily the best or is amazing or is, is, you know, they give it to us much more factual. Well, certainly it's not democratic anymore and lots of demand that you are loyal to the party mm. and lots of propaganda indoctrinated mm. Um, brainwashing constantly was 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 school kind of like the first thing that started to bleed communism um, oh it's everywhere it's everywhere what what was like what do you do you remember like the first big thing where you were from the start of when things started to change was there from your perspective from your eyes was there any 
positive change benefit or, you know, did it just continue to get worse and worse? Oh, just continue to get worse. There's no positive there. Um, wow. I became, you know, we, we have to let go of our maid. Oh. I just take up all the responsibility of what the maid's doing. So I was super busy. I mean, I'm suddenly, I have to mop the floor, the bottom floor, the second floor, the third floor. And I have to um, help my mom you know, uh, do all the cooking. And in Vietnam, we don't just buy grocery for a whole week. Every day, every morning, you go to the supermarket, to the wet market, and you buy whatever you need for the day only. Mm -hmm. You come home, you prepare fresh for lunch, and you have a little siesta, and then, you know, you do whatever you need to do, and then you cook again for dinner. So um, every day is super busy. And then I would do laundry, hand wash for everybody in the household. And and I was chasing all your uncles and aunt to 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 help them showers <laughs> and <laughs> and not too long my mom get pregnant so seventy six is when your uncle your your youngest uncle was born yeah. and that adds more work to the family and to me mm -hmm. so there's you know I I didn't have a whole lot of time to know what's going on in the adult world but there is a lot that affecting me. Uh, yeah. picking up more responsibility. And then later on, um, I I have to do a lot of trafficking for my mom, for anything that yeah. we need. The, talking about building up all of that responsibility, I mean, like you were already the eldest kid, you were already responsible for a lot of different things regarding your, your, your brothers and sisters and for the household. Mm -hmm. um, did you feel a, a, a level of resentment or just dislike to no, everything that at was that time, no no at that time mm -mm. it's just so normal every single firstborn in in that part of the country uh expected to help your parents so it's just like you, you, you it's just like well it's just everyday is, life yeah this is how it's supposed to be so yeah. you know i just i, I just gotta do right. it wow and I that, it's, to do the best to you know do more than i was expected man it, that's crazy. It's it's so it's so interesting how like the society develops the mindset and yeah. because of that, you know, looking at what you did, I I don't think there are there are many kids, you know, in 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 America or at least in this era that that would be able to handle that workload. Well, much less, I think you know, have, much less have that be called like like um like child labor, borderline child labor. Well, that's, that's why Asian have a lot of kids because kids supposed to help out family yeah. and, and <laughs> instead of, you know, saying that in America is like, Oh, a lot of kid, I have to take everybody to whatever activities and, you know, I have to feed them and I have to pay tuition in Vietnam. The more kids you have is actually, uh, yeah, you have to feed them, but you're hoping that they're going to grow up and they're going to mm -hmm. help you grow yeah. up fast. I mean, it's like, if, that's very normal for the oldest always um, holding their youngest brothers or sister, not even younger, younger. They would hold it on their hip everywhere mm -hmm. they go. I mean, that's, you see it everywhere. Uh, it's just like a natural thing. You, the, the, the oldest, you're expected to help your parents. And that's not even need to, to be taught. Anything mm -hmm. society accept or, or expect it, you just be part of it. You don't even think twice about why me <laughs> wow why not okay. you yeah no that, that that's a really interesting perspective so so i want to move forward from there so these things started to happen you started to take on more responsibility school started to change life started to change you started to see less and less of what you were comfortable or familiar with um and our chinese being cut back and now the vietnamese language take precedent you know before that is the other way around the other way around meaning we have a subject of everything in Chinese and Vietnamese is just pretty much the foreign language <laughs> did you did you have fluency in Vietnamese at that point I was yeah Vietnamese is easy to learn Chinese a hundred times harder because you have to <laughs> memorize all the characters mm -hmm. and Vietnamese luckily it's just run by Latin alphabet so I mean if you yeah. can spell it you can say it. You can, I mean, it, it's much easier. And plus, you know, you live in Vietnam and you hear a lot more in Vietnam as far as um, TV. So 
you okay. know, it's, it's definitely a lot more influence and it's easy to spell. And yeah, Vietnamese to me, that was easy. Now, poetry is not that easy, but yeah, poetry, <laughs> poetry is poetry never poetry easy in any language. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's, it's very hard in Chinese too. But after a year or two, so the schools is cut down to half a day instead of a whole day. So right. we used to go to school and then we come, we walk home. It's like school and home is about 15, 20 minutes walk. We'll walk home and we have lunch and then we'll walk back to school. But now the, the communists took over. Um, they divided by like either uh, morning students or afternoon students. So you yeah. only have half, half day school. And then the other half, um, sometimes you you go out to labor like you go pick trash on the streets and Mm -hmm. um you go to community and and they find a piece of land they say okay go you know plan something on that piece of land Mm -hmm. um lots of community works yeah and then at some point you just found it you just found school not interesting right was there like a was there like a point where you were like i gotta get out of here or did they yeah well for you yeah, I went to school, I think, um, up until 77, 78. Uh-huh. So 77, by that time, people already start to get antsy. Lots mm-hmm. of people, you know, lots of Chinese already find way to to flee the country. Oh, okay. So by 78, a uh, lot of commotion, you know, all the conversation is about who has connection, who's building a boat. Where can we buy a seat on that whatever boats, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, so lots of underground talking, lots of secrecies, lots of things. And all my friends, you know, my friends mostly, you know, saw a Chinese school, right? Still at that time, we're still Chinese and we still speak a lot of Chinese, but slowly, gradually, we start to, um, they call it Vietnamization, like, you know, start to switching language and they yeah. want you to speak more in Vietnamese yeah. and speak less in Chinese. Um, so by 78, um, I already got really discouraged because lots of my friends already like left. And if they're, they're not- all, They're all find means to escape. They, they are finding and talking. If they're not planning, uh, if they're not already left, they're either planning. Or and, and, they are going hiding so they can uh-huh. so they can um, switch that plan because a lot of time people find a reason say oh we're gonna go to the rural the countryside and do farming just like we did too and yeah. then you you disguise in a way that you are not somewhere that people can see you easily so that way when you left um, there's not a lot of awareness. Yeah. And, and from the communities, from the community's perspective, was that, was that like the rumor will was in full action. Everyone's talking about it. Everyone's trying to figure out like, or, or is it just kind of like you, you, you have these particular people or people that you know, and families that, you know, and then all yeah. of a sudden they're just like gone. Like, well, like, mostly, what, what like mostly Chinese because the exodus was designed to let the Chinese flee the country and mm-hmm. uh, the government would be able to get money from those Chinese capitalist people uh, mm-hmm. because they were at war with China at that time and Cambodia. Mm-hmm. So they, don't, they couldn't trust the minority in, China, in Vietnam, especially mm-hmm. all of these are Chinese and who's a spy with, you know, friend with, with China, they don't know. Mm-hmm. Um, so the, the design is, um, it, they're called semi-legal, semi-legal. Mm-hmm. So if you can find a port, you can build a boat, you can find a way to bribe whatever level of the official, you can find a route. If you are surface on, like, you can't make it legal, right? Because you're going to get to jail. But if you find a way somehow, the government sort of like, you know, wink, wink, uh, I'll, I'll let you go and buy your buy your way out so you can die out the sea. That's your problem because it's not my problem. I didn't kill you. You kill yourself. You Jesus. buy your passage, you know. Yeah. So lots of people willing to take that risk. And, and it almost uh, feels like it was a, it was kind of like a, you know, you're stuck between a rock and a hard place, right? Because um, there, like, there was a Chinese bubble that was existing within the Vietnamese community. And so within the Vietnamese community, um, it, it, it sounds like you're saying that 
a lot of the Vietnamese people just had innate distrust in Chinese people. Wealth of Vietnamese in Vietnam, they want to leave too. They, you know, they, they don't want to live under communists either. So a lot of mm -hmm. them start looking for way and talk to all the Chinese people and say, hey, I have money. Do you have seat in your boat? Um, and my dad sell a lot of seed because he's also built boat, but all the, I, I think they get four boat owner, four people put money in to build this big boat here. And I'm saying big, this is like, it's not a big boat, but compared to most of other people, this is huge. You know, most of the people, they get up to maybe 300, 375 people. My boats, we get 502 people. Wow. I think they overstuff, but the boat, uh, it's about 90 feet long. Mm -hmm. So that's about 28 meter long and eight meter wide. So it's about nine, nine yard. What is it? Yeah. Nine yards, eight meters, about nine yards mm -hmm. and 28 meters. It's about 30 yards, probably mm -hmm. a little more or less, more or less 30, maybe 30 some yards, mm -hmm. but, um, that's considered, that's considering big. Yeah. And mm -hmm. it took him a lot of people on that. That's ridiculous. Yeah. Oh, well, we're mm -hmm. stacking like, you know, uh, sardine, mind you. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. But the thing is to even just to prepare all the food, you can't just buy, like going to Costco and get a truckload of thing and just load it on the boat. You can't. Yeah. Costco Costco is <laughs> not an option. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, what you do is like you buy little by little by little and then you stock up and then you put in, put in the, you know, but you buy you buy all the, you already bribe all the official from the very lower rank to the higher rank. You already grease them, their palms everywhere you go uh, for a whole year or even longer. He started. So it's a really like long journey. You have to have patience and you have to know who to trust because, you know, 500 people, that's the family. If And, mm -hmm. and not 500 people are all paid. You know, some of my friends and my cousin didn't pay. If people are there at the time and they want to come in, you don't, they might create trouble. They might go to become an informant and they might call the police or somebody. So yeah. a lot of time people are opportunists. Um, they just know that the boat's going to be taking off. So they make sure that they're going to be there. And a lot of people are down the rural side because they mm -hmm. see that lots of ports is being used as a place that to load all this refugee, you know, all these mm -hmm. people. Yeah. But and that, that's definitely ahead. jumping ahead. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's definitely like the, the preparation and, you know, the, the activities and anticipation to, you know, setting off for that, that, that refugee, you know, journey on, by boat. This is definitely something, you know, we, we need to cover and we need to talk about. Um, but I, I definitely want to, you know, ensure that I, I hear and I understand what life was like for you during that transformative period. So, yeah, there's a lot of things happening. There's so many nuance, everyday life. It's just tons of stuff that um, I didn't even put it all in the book because it's just so mm -hmm. many. And yeah. I couldn't possibly remember all of them. But mm -hmm. there's a lot of things that I know that the school become no longer interest. That's for sure. I mean, yeah. I... I was told in school that uh, you got to go, you should go home and spy on your parent. If you hear anything that your parent planning to leave, or if you know that they have money hiding somewhere, you should come back and tell your teacher and tell your, mm -hmm. tell your, um, the party leader. And, and that was, that was, that was just so against what, like what your parents had con conditioned obviously. you to, right? Yeah, yeah. obviously. Um, and, mm -hmm. and I went home and I was like, mom, I don't feel like going to school anymore because. But, but, but did some of your friends do that? Did some of, did some of the people that you knew like. Oh yeah. They... And I always coming home is like, when are we leaving? Cause some of my friends already left. It's almost like you, you get anxious because. Well, not, not only, not, not even just like what, cause some of your friends already left, but did some of your friends even like turn on their parents and. No, and... luckily I don't know anybody who did. Um, okay. not That's personally, good. I don't know. Um, uh -huh. but there are story, you know, there's a story, lots of stories, but I don't, I mean, none of my friends, um, why people or anybody who's, uh, who is rebellion. I mean, mm -hmm. all of my friends are good, good girls. And <laughs> That's interesting because boys. I think, you know, at, at the very least that, that shows that, 
the community itself held together stronger than what the government was trying to force it to do, right? Like, oh, yeah, so but it, they, it almost, they're hopeless. They're hopeless. They can't, they have no power. They held together, uh, finding plan to escape, but they can't really do a thing to the government. Well, uh, what, what, I, what I'm saying is like, they, they had a choice, right? Like they, they could have very easily went to a Vietnamese official and said, hey, you know, um, Tai Ong is, is, is planning an escape. And, and, you know, if you give me something, I can tell you what he's they hiding. But they that. chose not to do that. They could no. They're not. They choose not choose. But very secrecy. We don't tell anybody. It's like a whole year. We just say that we are finding a piece of land so we can go farming. You don't just tell your friends or anybody at all. You learn how to keep your mouth shut in those society. Um, so, so how does that how does that work when also at the same time there's a lot of people discussing you know like hey when's like do you do you have any connect I know. connections yeah, to like, how does that work you discuss it top uh secret like my my dad built this boat and he sell ticket to my next door neighbor and she didn't go but her son and her son's wife and his you know the son's the, the in-law the wife's family they're wealthy mm -hmm. so they bought ticket um, they, they bought the seat on the boat. So they are part of that too. So they have to be super secret too, because, you know, if anything, they got caught because they want to get out also. So, I yeah. mean, you know that you can only absolutely sure to tell the person if you know that that person has been looking for a way to, to escape and mm -hmm. their life, their money is in your hand. You, you don't, I mean, you don't just trust anybody to for those yeah. those kind of news and and when that and when the gear started turning there for for when your parents started making moves did they like did they sit you down like you and all of the other brothers and sisters all your other brothers and sisters were like listen if anything gets asked you say you know nothing like what was that education well, i'm the only one who knows none of the i, I mean yeah um my my younger brother Yotoku, probably know a little bit he was about 10 Mm -hmm. So he would hear say, but I mean, even at that time, even children, children, I mean, like uh, Sa'i probably not know much because she was about nine years old, eight or nine. And then mm -hmm. Sa'i's is about six. And um, I don't talk about it. So you just you kept know. him out of the dark completely. Oh, yeah. I talked to my cousin, my older cousin, and she left a year before I did. Uh -huh. And um, you just you just don't casually mention anything to anybody. Yeah. And like I said in the book, you trust no one. Yeah, it's probably best you just keep the the like circle. Yeah, side. just keep him out of it completely. It's probably easiest that way, huh? Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. So okay. So yeah, everything was uh, hand down, super mm -hmm. careful, and yeah. none of us go out and talk to friends or anything there's no phone there's no facebook so <laughs> i think that probably would have made it a lot tougher huh <laughs> probably would have made it a lot tougher imagine <laughs> posting like an instagram story just fill a boat and leave in a few days i know yeah right <laughs> imagine that um i think next episode i want to get more into the, you know the activities you did um you know how you observe your parents getting you know ready for for this journey but one question that i wanted to wrap this up on was you know you talk a lot about how just from the um, j just from when you were changing transformatively in school, how it was different to, you know, how that impacted your home life and all of this responsibility. You know, I only want to touch on this briefly, but when, when you came to America, and you met people from different cultural backgrounds, you know, diversities, obviously it's a very different story for them. Did you ever at some point feel like, you have lost a lot of your childhood and did you ever work on or think of, you know, or act upon getting that back or reliving that in some sort of sense? No, nope. all of feeling didn't come until after I have you. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. 
after so, I had you, then all my brother and sister grown up and they all graduated from college and they all out. And then I look back and say, like, wow, you know what? I've been taking care of everybody and I forgot about my own childhood. And, wow. Uh, yeah. Not until that late? Mm hmm because it's just like, you know, it's in your DNA. I never even questioned about it. I know that my job is to help my parents and to help my brother and sisters. Uh -huh. well, and, and until I had you, um, and then my dad, you know, passed away. And I feel like my mom is my responsibility. And then I didn't really have a great relationship with, your, with my mom at the time after I have you. And mm -hmm. then resentment start coming in. It's like, why do I have to take care of everybody, including her? I mean, she's so capable. Why do I, you know, so, I mean, it's yeah. not the best period because I think, you know, when, when you staying together after a while, mother, daughter is always have the, the conflicts and things that um, you, you, you wish you could just set it out, but because you bottle up for so many years and then yeah. you just never thought about it. And then one day mm -hmm. you just realize like, Holy cow, you know, where's my youth? I didn't get a chance to even, uh, if you don't think about the family, you're considering selfish, sort of speak. And that's just so wrong. I mean, it mm -hmm. took me a long time to know that I need some self-care because um, I completely sort of neglecting my, what I want. What does Lee want? What is, you know, what do I want to do? Yeah. There's no time. I'm always thinking when I do this, is that benefiting my brother? Is it benefit my mom? Benefit my younger brother, my sister? Mm -hmm. Like down to every single thing, vacations, you know, big purchase, everything. It's always thinking about the family. And yeah. I never really, I, I'm not regretting it, but it just felt like, you know, we, we never have a life that I call my own. Mm hmm well, and yeah, I think, I think, you know, due to the actions of, of, of your work, of your product and everything, you know, you have a lot to be thankful for and grateful for because mm -hmm. you had worked so hard to achieve that stuff. But again, there's, there's that all other side of balance that, that needs to be explored just to, you know, you know, just to be a healthy person. Yeah. Um, so hopefully, hopefully, you <laughs> when know, when I now, go now to honeymoon, your dad want to take my youngest brother. Yes, I go to go. <laughs> <laughs> And that's something to be talked about, you know. I yeah. was like, no, you want to go honeymoon with my brother, you go. I stay home. <laughs> <laughs> and he's but, like, well, um, the guy just lost his dad, you know. I was mm. like, well, you know, you know what? Not on honeymoon. <laughs> yeah. Well, but, you know, that's, you know, that's kind of the level that we always think about the family. And then at some point, yeah, that's why I say resentment is bad. But sometimes you don't even know that you re resent it until yeah. a certain certain time. Then you're just like, Holy cow. I was not happy all this time, but I didn't know that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that, that's, that's incredibly powerful. Um, and, it, and it's a lot of different things. It's, 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 it shows strength. It provides like almost a, 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 a rather toxic mentality at times. Um, and it's a, it's a whole bunch of other things and more, but, you know, I hope, I hope that, um, you know, in, in these, in these years and, and the more to come, you're, you're able to, be a little bit more selfish for yourself. And I, I can honestly say that, yeah, the guilt trip, my, you know, I'm, I'm always, Asian is great about living in sorrow and in guilt. And I think, mm -hmm. you know, I'm no different. We, we love to dwell on our sorrows. And uh, I, I was trying to able to walk away from it six years ago and saying yeah. that uh, we're not getting none any younger. So, yeah. That's powerful, but it, but it is incredibly healthy. Um, but yeah, um, so so thank you, thank you everyone for listening. Um, again, this is Roots. Um, so what's the point of this episode is to find yourself. I guess that um, sometimes we don't know what we feel until years and years later. But I think the best thing is just to get acknowledge of every yeah. stage in your life. Um, don't go to the extreme, like home responsibility is good being an older sister care for the siblings is nothing bad i'm proud that i was able to do that for my parents for my siblings um but sometimes you do get drained if you're not really thinking that um you gotta leave a little and and then the resentment somehow we're gonna seep its way back 
And then you're going to find yourself like hating yourself or resent to people or things that they didn't know. So, so it was not their fault. It's my fault. I didn't realize that. And it took me a while to realize that. And, and it's not too late. I didn't miss that boat. So <laughs> I am. <laughs> there you go. Um, thanks mom for the conversation. Thanks for, um, you know, sharing a part of yourself today. Um, thanks again, everyone else for listening. And um, mom, if you have anything else to say, um, let's hear it. Otherwise, um, actually, yeah, do, you, do you have anything else to say? But if you want more detail, you know, reach out and grab my book on Amazon or on my website. And uh, if you have a story about your immigrant um, family story, uh, the gap between your parents and you, things that you might find that what we talk is helpful, um, you know, reach out and and connect with us or um, get a notification on the YouTube. So, so when our, we talk about our uh, next episode, you you get a notification on that. But um, thank you everyone for uh, again listening. Um, have a great rest of the week, and we will catch you on the next one. All right. Thank you. Bye. Uh, bye.